When you think of a well-respected quality general manager in any league, you think of many traits. Traits that make the GM one of the greats. Those being strategy and development, good negotiation tactics, and elite asset management. Names that come to mind in the modern NHL are mainly Steve Eiserman and Joe Sackick. But there are as many bad general managers as good general managers. And all general managers have had their moments. But when going back in time, one man may have been so incompetent that he he made Peter Shirelli look decent. He's been credited with the collapse of a once great franchise due to impatience thanks to a hunger to win now. To him, nothing was good enough. That man was Mad Mike Milbury, and in order to find out how he destroyed the Islanders, it's gonna take a lot. Milbury made many foolish moves too many to count, but in today's video, we'll be looking back at some of his worst transactions and going over the timeline of the worst general manager in NHL history. But before we begin, this video is sponsored by SeatGeek. SeatGeek is an app that allows users to purchase tickets to games, concerts, and live events. SeatGeek makes buying tickets simple as they rate them on a scale from 1 to 100 so you know you're getting a good deal. If you haven't already, use my promo code IDGT at checkout to save $20 off your first purchase. Thanks so much for SeatGeek for sponsoring today's video. Now let's resume where we left off. Mike Milbury was once in the NHL himself. Although known as more of a physical force, he would still produce over 200 points and would play in over 750 games on a Bruins sweater. Milbury's NHL career is mostly highlighted due to one particular play. After a game was over between the Rangers and Bruins, Milbury would become infamous for beating a fan with their own shoe. Once Mike retired after the 86-87 season, he would take some time off before coaching for the Bruins Bruins in the 89-90 season, and in just his first year behind the bench, he would take the Bruins all the way to the Stanley Cup Final, and a year later would make it back to the Conference Finals, and that's honestly really good. Well, a few years later come 1995, the Islanders were on the decline and needed a guy like Milbury to rejuvenate the franchise, so they thought. See, Milbury was an alright coach, and probably would have done all he could to help a struggling Islanders team, but management made the mistake of also naming him the general manager a few months later. And this is where the timeline begins. Milbury's first notable trade took place on January 23rd of 1996, when he would acquire Martin Straka and Brian Berard for Damian Rhodes and Wade Redden. Now, Brian Berard would actually turn out pretty well. He would take home Rookie of the Year after being selected first overall in the previous draft and posted respectable numbers on Long Island. Straka would also go on to have a solid career, but not with the Islanders, because Straka would be put on waivers just 22 games into his tenure with the club. The player they gave up, Wade Redden, would become a staple on the Sens' blue line for many years, playing in over 1,000 NHL games and placing himself fifth all-time in Ottawa Senators history in points. So yeah. On the plus side though, that same year, Milbury would turn Wendell Clark into a first round pick that would be used to select Roberto Luongo, but we'll get back to him later. Mike's Islanders would continue to struggle, and the rebuild wasn't going to plan. In 1996, the Isles would go 22, 50, and 10, and in 1997, they would finish 29, 41, and 12. Milbury now had two options, start growing the prospect pool and accumulate assets, or trade prospects to force the team into contention. Which do you think Milbury chose. On February 6, 1998, with his Islanders still on the decline, Mike knew there was only one way to fix his team. Experienced veterans. That veteran was Trevor Linden, who would only cost him Todd Bertuzzi and Brian McCabe, and also a third round pick that turned into Yarko Rutu. But that's okay, because Linden has experience. It's not like Bertuzzi would turn into a reliable power forward or anything, that'll never happen. Let's also trade away JP Dumont as well for Dmitry Nabokov, who would only play with the Islanders for 30 games, producing 13 points. To be fair, Dumont didn't stick around the Chicago that long either, but once arriving in Buffalo, he kinda went off. The Islanders would suck once again, and Milbury refused to back down. He knew what he must do, trade more young talent. Remember Brian Burrard? Well, 
He's now gone. Milbury shipped him off to Toronto for two years of Felix Popvin. Popvin would go 7-24 and 4 as an Islander, and Berard would also last two years as a Leaf, but Milbury essentially turned Wade Redden into Felix Popvin, who would later be shipped off to Vancouver for three players, with Kevin Weeks being the most notable of the bunch. Oh, and also, Trevor Linden would only last two years before he got shipped out too, for a first round pick that turned into Bronislav Mize. Milbury would acquire Ole Jokinen though, but it came at the price of Ziggy Palfi. We'll touch back on Jokinen later though. The 99 and 2000 Islanders would, to no one's surprise, also stink, but at least things were sort of looking up. The Islanders would have two picks in the top five for the upcoming 2000 draft, having the first overall pick and the fifth overall pick. The fifth pick, courtesy of Kevin Weeks, as he would be traded to Tampa Bay. Milbury now had the opportunity to turn things around, and as we head into the 2000s, things can't get any worse, right? So this morning, with much anticipation, hope, and excitement, the New York Islanders are picking Rick DiPietro, for a goaltender from Boston University as a number one pick. This pick was interesting. The Islanders already had promising goaltending with Roberto Luongo, so taking a goalie with the number one pick seemed confusing. Oh, that's right! Milbury would trade Luongo alongside of Ole Jokinen for Oleg Kavasha and Mark Parish. Let's see how that one turned out. Roberto Luongo only became fourth all-time in wins amongst all goaltenders in NHL history, and that Ole Jokinen guy would sort of become a big deal once becoming a Panther, but at least Parrish would produce 60 points for the Islanders and ended up becoming a consistent scorer, so that price wasn't too hefty to pay. But the Islanders still had another selection, however, so let's give Milbury some credit. With the fifth overall pick, he would select Rafi Torres. You can't make this up. 2001 would also be another rough year for the Islanders, and Milbury was once again becoming extremely impatient. He had to make a big move and acquire a face of the franchise. Mike decided to hit up Ottawa and would trade away more young assets for Ottawa Senators star Alexi Yashin. Just one problem. Yashin had a horrible attitude problem. During his five years in Ottawa, Yashin would be a consistent 60 to 70 point producer, but he would also demand a new contract three times and even sat out the 99-2000 season after being suspended by the team and being stripped from his captaincy. So the Islanders were in for a treat, but let's see what it cost them. Bill Mukok, a 2001 first round pick, and a 24-year-old Zdeno Chara. Chara would have some solid seasons on the blue line with, oh, Wade Redden, and that 2001 first round pick would turn out to become Jason Spezza, who would become a star alongside of Daniel Alfredson and the all-star himself, Danny Heatley. Yashin's time on Long Island would be eventful. He did sorta help turn the team around though, actually helping the Islanders make the playoffs in 2003 and 2004. Now, granted, the Islanders may not have even surpassed round one, but considering the circumstances, that was impressive. How did Yashin get rewarded? With a 10-year, $87.5 million dollar deal, making him the highest paid player in the league at the time. Also, remember Di Pietro? Well, he too was actually really good during those 03 and 04 playoff runs. How would he be rewarded? With an even bigger contract, a 15-year, $67.8 million deal. Sadly for Rick, however, he would begin suffering from multiple injuries, which would eventually derail his career, turning him into one of the biggest busts in NHL history, and also one of the richest players. As as he's still getting paid as of today because his massive deal would be bought out in 2013, so he'll be getting paid $1.5 million every year until 2029. But let's go back to 2003, one of the best draft classes of all time, as certainly Milbury had to select someone of importance. With the 15th pick, he would select Robert Nilsson. Nilsson wasn't bad, but considering who he was chosen before, it looks pretty bad. Milbury would continue to make some confusing moves up until 2006, and during the tail end of his reign of terror, Alexi Yashin would also get bought out, after the team realized that a 10-year contract probably wasn't a smart idea. Milbury would step down in 2006, and the infamous Milbury era would officially come to an end.
The results of the Millberry era are still in effect as of today. Thankfully, the Islanders are once again a consistent threat in the Eastern Conference and are extremely close to making it back to a Stanley Cup final, but they're still, as of today, paying DiPietro $1.5 million and watching guys like Zdeno Chara finish out their successful careers elsewhere. The Islanders would once again lose a lot of players come the 2010s, Tavares included, but they were able to properly build through the draft and showcase great assets management helping create a successful rebuild, something Milberry never had the patience to do. The sad reality about this video is that this could literally happen to any team, as all it takes is one man who is so power hungry and impatient to turn a struggling franchise into a decade long journey through hell.